Ladies and gentlemen, good morning or good evening, wherever you may happen to be. I'm Ronnie Chan. I'm Chairman Emeritus of Asia Society Globally, and I still chair the Hong Kong Center. I want to welcome all of you to another wonderful Asia Society program. In particular, I want to thank Stephen Scott. We thank you for putting this program together. We thank you for inviting Gary Cohn. We're delighted that all of you can join us. As you know, financial service is 20-some uh, percent of Hong Kong's economy now. 
It's important to Tokyo, it's important to Singapore, it's important to New York. So this program cannot be more timely and important. Uh, we all know that, um, uh, Gary, you were the economic czar, shall we say, uh, of uh, the White House uh, for, some year, for some time. Uh, we're delighted that you can join us. Uh, I'm happy to tell you, uh, I don't know whatever emotion it may uh, evoke, uh, but your former colleague of Goldman Sachs succeeded me three and a half years ago to be now the co-chair of the ASA Society globally, and that is John Thornton. Uh, Charles, great to have you. You just retired from Hong Kong. I think Hong Kong's economy can now really, really do well, uh, but we do miss you a lot, Charles. And we're delighted that we also have someone from uh, Mitsu Matsu from uh, Tokyo. As I was telling everyone before the program began, uh, Tokyo is probably Hong Kong people's uh, favorite city, uh, favorite destination. Uh, hopefully we can travel again very soon. Uh, Mr. Mazur, thank you for joining us. We're delighted to have you. And Loretta, Loretta, great to have Singapore with us. Singapore is a wonderful, wonderful city and a wonderful financial center. Uh, as I joke with my friends, if not for Charles Lee, Singapore will really search ahead now. Uh, but uh, we're delighted that Singapore is a smart place. Uh, among other things, your bank, Loretta, uh, the, uh, the last uh, CEO is from Hong Kong, old friend of ours. Uh, and then the present one is also uh, from Hong Kong. So you are very open market in order to get the best of the world to work in Singapore. And that's why you're so strong. So Stephen, uh, with that, I will just uh, turn it to you and thank you again, Stephen, for joining us and uh, uh, moderating this wonderful, wonderful discussion on red tech risk management, uh, corporate governance, something that are important to all the cities that are represented here. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Stephen Scott. Ronnie, thank you very much. I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to be here, um, particularly since my only connection really to Asia is that I like the food. Um, so my, my job in this conversation is to try and moderate what I hope will be a conversation. Um, I think we've all got a little bit of Zoom and, and uh, Microsoft Teams burnout. Uh, so rather than having a series of, of talking heads, the, the idea here is to have a bit of a free-flowing conversation initially among our panelists, and then we'd like to invite some of our listeners to join in. Uh, let me echo Ronnie, uh, good afternoon, good evening to those who are joining from North America, uh, Josan to those in Hong Kong, Tsao Shanghao, and Ohio Gazaimas, and for those who may have joined from Australia, of course, good day. Um, <laughs> To, to start off with this, with this distinguished panel, let me uh, introduce uh, Gary Cohn. Um, the backgrounds and uh, bios of, of the panelists uh, don't need too much mention. Gary was, um, of course, the COO and president of Goldman Sachs for a number of years, served as the director of the US National Economic Council in the White House, and was recently named the vice chair of IBM. Uh, Loretta Yuen, as uh, Ronnie mentioned, is EVP, uh, group general counsel, and head of group regulatory and, and compliance at OCBC in Singapore. Uh, Matsuo Motonobu has had a long history with the Japan Financial Services Agency and uh, relatively recently was made the Secretary General of the Securities and Exchange Surveillance Commission. Uh, and of course, Charles Lee uh, is uh, applying to be CEO of the Hong Kong Exchange again, if all goes well. <laughs> Um, so to, to kick us off, um, if I may, Gary, I'd like to just ask you to maybe set the stage for the, the conversation. You know, we've had prominent misconduct scandals in every major financial market in the world in recent years, and that's led bank regulators to be placing uh, ever greater emphasis on the management of uh, non-financial risk, right? The financial crisis was triggered by financial risk, and the concern now is that non-financial risk is what needs attention. And at the same time, reg tech has evolved from what was a niche market to what is now an established subsector of the financial industry. Uh, some reports suggest that the market should grow to about $16 billion in size by 2025, with much of that growth coming from Asia. As a reg tech investor yourself, uh, can you say a little bit about what drew you to this space and what global trends suggest for the Asian region in your experience? Stephen, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, and same, uh, good day or uh, good evening, good morning to all of, all of you. Um, look, it's 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 a really fascinating question, fascinating space, and I think we're 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 sort of entering the new frontier of regulation in 
that's the quick and dirty answer why, why I got drew, drawn to this, but let me elaborate on that. If you think of how we've been regulating financial markets for the last three decades, four decades, we've basically been doing the same things. And when I say we, I, the financial institutions, as well as the regulatory community, they've been doing the same type of activity. They've been looking at the same types of information. They've been looking at the same types of reports. A lot of it is basically focused on backwards looking activity, backward looking data. It's not about looking forward and predicting what's gonna happen and monitoring human behavior. But if you think where we are in, in 2021 with quantum computing, and you think where we are with artificial intelligence, we're in a whole new paradigm. We're in a paradigm where the idea of looking at historical data and looking for bad actors and behaviors was the only thing at regulators disposal for the prior decades. But I think going forward, the way we're gonna start looking at banks and regulate banks and other companies around the world and other activities is we're gonna start trying to look at predictive behavior and predictive analytics because we have the computing capabilities. So we're gonna look at the way people interact with each other. We're gonna look at the way people talk and communicate with each other. And we're gonna say, look, this is different today. That doesn't necessarily mean someone's doing something wrong, but it's gonna give regulators or people with inside corporations or institutions an idea of where to start looking. If someone's doing the same thing every day of their life and nothing changes, there's probably nothing unique or nothing wrong going on there. But if all of a sudden you start seeing a change in behavior, a change in activity, it's probably an interesting place to look. And so I do think we're on this really unique frontier with the computing capabilities we have in the world today to start forward looking and looking at people's behavior and looking at people's activities real time instead of looking at historical data. And that's what's really drawn me into the space. Thank you, Gary. That's great. And let me ask if any of the panelists would like to react to that. And if not, I will call on someone. <laughs> No? Okay, so if I may, um, Matsuo-san, maybe I can ask you to, to comment on that um, since you are overseeing markets and in particularly since um, your new Prime Minister Suga has said that uh, creating a digital agency is an important thing for Japan and digitizing the way the government operates is a key priority of his administration. So I wonder if you have any thoughts on what Gary's had to say and can maybe introduce a little bit of what's happening in Japan for the audience. Okay, uh, so uh, I totally agree with uh, uh, Gary. I mean, uh, everything, uh, in, in my opinion, the uh, now regulation is about innovation and the, the safety. So you, you have to uh, have the right balance. That's the challenge for every uh, single uh, like regulatory bodies, I think. And the, what's happening in Japan is uh, first, uh, the digital uh, digitalization initiative. So digital agency will formally start this year, become the control tower of digitalization. And so we eliminate the need for written stamp and face-to-face -face procedures. So you can do everything without going to the government office. What we, That's what we are trying to do. And uh, of course the uh, digitalized uh, medical and education, which is a uh, ID terminals for all elementary and junior high school students, so expand online education and medical. And the uh, Japanese national ID is a big issue. And the, so it's a uh, Japanese version of uh, my number cards will be uh, start integrated with national insurance cards in, Mar uh, in March and uh, proceed with the digitalization of driver's license and combines. And the, uh, of course, the FSA will improve data strategy and analytical capabilities for accurate graphism of the actual financial situation. That's what uh, the Gary said. And he, as a data strategy, we have uh, established frameworks and rules for collecting, managing, and utilizing data, as well as diversity, uh, uh, diversifying analytical methods and calibrating human resources. And the, uh, of course, the uh, Tokyo's uh, transformation to uh, become agile financial hub is a big issue uh, uh, right now. And the, uh, we uh, decided to revise the taxes, uh, tax uh, law. And the, uh, for the inheritance tax, uh, we will amend the tax law so that the asset outside of Japan will be exempt from Japanese uh, inheritance tax, regardless of foreign nationals' years of residency in Japan. And the other corporate tax and income tax uh, kind of revision uh, 
Uh, and uh, besides that, uh, we created a, a new fast truck entry truck for uh, foreign business, uh, managing mainly foreign funds, uh, which uh, uh, we're going to uh, submit the bill for this uh, coming uh, diet session for those who manage funds mainly provided by foreign professional investors or for business operating within a certain limited trans uh, transmission period. And besides that, uh, we, uh, we established the Financial Market Entry Support Office this week in JFSA to provide prior consultation, registration, and supervision in English for newly entering financial business operators. And the for the corporate, uh, corporate governance, uh, we have kind of movement in April 2022. The Tokyo Stock, market, uh, Stock Exchange will shift to a new market segment, namely prime market stock and standard market and gross market. And the prime market is basically the equivalent of first section of t uh, TSE. And the, uh, uh, we're going to revise the corporate governance code so that the, uh, uh, the prime market listed company will be required to appoint at least one third of the independent outside directors. That's what's gonna happen. And the, in addition, if the company uh, that considered necessary to take into account their business environments should be encouraged to consider appointing more than half of the independent outside directors. And the, uh, the other point is uh, the diversity of the board. So the listed companies should be required to set out their ideas and voluntary measurable goals for ensuring diversity in the recruitment of core human resources, which is uh, women, foreigners, and mid-career hires kind of stuff. So that's what uh, uh, happening in Japan. Thank you very much, Matsuo-san. Um, and I, I think that's a great segue Loretta if, if, if I can if I can call on 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 you to offer us a, a view on these topics that both Gary and Matsu san have now raised um, we see in Singapore that the monetary authority has placed a, a greater emphasis on managing culture and conduct in the banking industry uh, and leveraging technology in order to drive greater trust in the industry as a whole um, we see that the Association of Banks in Singapore has created a culture and conduct steering group among the more prominent for firms uh, in Singapore. Uh, and OCBC, your firm made news with the creation of the first ever, if I have it right, board level committee to oversee ethics and conduct. So within the context of what, what Gary and, and Matsuo-san have shared, maybe you can give us a little sense of what's happening in Singapore. Sure, sure. Hello, everyone. Happy to be here and uh, happy to share some viewpoints from Singapore in the culture and conduct space. Actually, to your point, Stephen, actually since 2019, the Association of Banks, we set up a culture and conduct steering group. And this group has been working really, really closely with the MAS, our central bank. And the idea and the objective is to see how we can further strengthen culture and conduct standards as an industry in Singapore. So this effort now, we can see that is mirrored quite largely at the organization level at each bank. And we are seeing more and more, I think if not all Singapore banks by now, making the effort, making a real effort to monitor and manage conduct risk within our respective organization. And it's really through conduct risk management frameworks and guidance from the MES. Um, well, you, alluded, you alluded to what's been happening in OCBC, you're absolutely right. Our board and senior management takes our culture and conduct risk management really seriously. And there's a strong desire within my firm to want to get this right. We really want to deepen and elevate our standards of culture and conduct for, not for our staff as well as our organization. So over the last two years, we have spent, I think, a significant amount of time and resources to make sure we kind of walk the talk, right? So evidence of our efforts, as uh, you alluded to, Stephen, that we set up a, a dedicated board level committee. And this board level committee provides like the steering beacon uh, guidance on how we want to move on our culture and conduct journey. And um, over the last two years, I would say maybe uh, more, more likely in the last 10 months, we have seen an incremental roll-up initiatives under our program. We've done a lot of work on that. Uh, this, this program is an in-house initiative um, designed to promote a culture of trust and ethical behaviors within the group. So I won't go into too much of what we're doing there, but uh, if later if someone in the QA asks me, I can give it a bit more detail. But I wanted to cover, Stephen, what you asked um, on what we expect to see in 2021 in Singapore in this space. I think three areas of significant growth, um, the establishment of individual accountability regimes within um, banks in Singapore. I think we've started to see that in, in, the, in, in Europe and uh, we're, we're starting to see that in Asia as well. That's the first one. The second one is um, something a little bit of what uh, Gary covered just now, maybe more positive reinforcement of good behaviors. 
And the last one, I think it's what our audience will be most interested in is the regular monitoring and assessment of conduct risk levels and how we use technology and probably dashboards methodology to do that. So the implementation of the first one, I'll talk about implementation of the IAC guidelines, Individual Accountability Conduct Guidelines. These were recently issued, I know you know, Stephen, in, uh, by the MAS uh, last September. So us banks in Singapore, as the boots on the ground, we have, to, we have one year to operationalize all its requirements. But just to keep it really quick, um, under these guidelines, what are we expected to do? Um, firstly, identify all our senior managers, identify all our material risk takers, make sure that they're fit and proper for their roles, make sure that they're held accountable not only for their actions, but the actions of their staff, make sure that we have an effective risk governance and appropriate incentive structures in place, and really establish a framework that promote and sustain uh, desired behaviours among employees. Let me talk about the second one, which is a, a follow-on to what Gary brought up, where, we, where um, he said that you know, um, a lot of times our practices so far has been kind of backward looking. So similarly in Singapore, right? traditionally when, we, when, when a misconduct happens, what happens? Uh, everybody rushes to identify what the root cause is, take swift action to remediate the clothes, the gaps, and then uh, punish the wrongdoers, right? So I think this has been effective so far in trying to deter future misconduct. But I think as the Singapore industry, our discussions have uh, concluded that um, to, it, it's quite reactionary and the better way going forward is also to complement it with promoting uh, positive reinforcement, right? And what we mean by that is to visibly recognize and reward good behavior and kind of raise employees' awareness of really what good looks like. So in OCBC, we've done quite a lot of that. We've um, um, formally recognized a lot of employees by awarding them um, awards, you know, th those who show and display our core values with the action and behaviors. And over in my peer bank, DBS, another uh, local bank in Singapore, they have done something quite cute. They have used comic strips, really, uh, to tell like little stories of employee good conduct, employee examples. In, uh, and these comic strips, I think, um, have been receiving quite a lot of uh, good feedback, has, been, has resonated quite well with staff. So I think we're all looking to see what we can do in that space. The last one I want to talk about was the regular monitoring and assessment of conduct risk levels. I think a lot of active development will be coming through in this space as we see a lot of awareness amongst banks to, make, uh, to want to monitor uh, culture and conduct because we, want to, we know that this is necessary to ensure that our, our initiatives are effective when we actually roll them out. So a lot of FIs and, uh, and banks in Singapore, we have um, been doing a lot of work um, coming up with dedicated dashboards. There's a lot of work around that. I think our audience would know, right? The methodology, thinking about how a, a appropriate methodology works, the number of metrics used, the frequency of monitoring. Now, all this is um, kind of varies from bank to bank because it depends on the size operations, the risk appetite. But we're all at the, at this space right now, experimenting, building our own dashboards. Um, I feel that it probably take about two years for us to really get this right. I think we are kind of like kind of uh, tweaking around it, making sure that it works. Um, two years is probably needed to collect the data points, um, analyze data patterns within and across the metrics and so that we can gauge the overall effectiveness of the methodology. So I think uh, the use of dashboards um, as, a, as a means of uh, conduct risk monitoring is likely to be an area of active development, not just in 2021, but I think in a few years after that as well. Um, so us banks, we are continuously refining and improving our monitoring and assessment methodology. So that's a space that we are currently very busy with. Thank Back you. That's uh, very interesting. You, you and I could have a much longer conversation of that um, on that topic. Of course, um, I run a reg tech firm, so we're always interested to hear how different firms around the world are, are looking to the reg tech space. Mm -hmm. and, um, and with that, Charles, if, if I may turn to you, um, picking up on some of what Loretta has just shared, this focus on conduct and this, this focus on deterring it um, so that is to say, identifying it before it takes place and deterring it rather than being reactive to it. Um, that has been a topic for the Hong Kong Exchange in recent years. We've seen the HKAX seeking greater disciplinary powers, specifically aimed at uh, creating greater capabilities to deter misconduct. And we've also heard the Hong Kong Exchange make the argument that risk management shouldn't be viewed as a cost, but rather it should be viewed as, as a competitive advantage if it's done right. So I wonder if I can ask you to expand on those ideas a little bit and, um, and maybe weave that into some of what's gone before. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, as the operator of the market, we obviously are looking at all this macro st structure issues on conduct, on risk, on, you know, behavior changes, and also on code and, you know, exercising our regulatory oversight, trying to influence directions. 
But I think uh, more importantly, um, the exchange itself, but broadly speaking, the Hong Kong market, um, we actually uh, are dealing with risk probably, you know, in a much more intense manner, uh, looking at much broader, bigger risks that actually sometimes have such a huge uh, disproportional impact on our market. Essentially, you know, we used to have to deal with largely China, you know, what China is going to do with Hong Kong, what China is going to do with itself, and generally speaking, what China is going to do about opening up. But the last four years, uh, you know, our job become so much more impossible because now we have a very big, uh, you know, a market, a, a very big political and, uh, and, uh, and the world leader that we used to be able to take for granted as being friendly and uh, as the you know uh, as the facilitator of opening and the reform of china has becoming you know a very important rival and a very important competitor and that now we have to worry what the us is going to do to itself what the us is going to do to china and uh, even sometimes what the us is going to do to hong kong and that really put our market into this tremendous amount of stress between the giants but increasingly, we are seeing a third big emerging elephant that we have to deal with as our market, as, our, as the underlying of our market becoming more and more big tech, more and more companies that are really you know, accumulating, developing, monetizing, at the same time help the economy and to develop is the massive data that is being built. I mean, China arguably is more digitalized than any other economy in the world today, all the way to the veins. And that digitalization means that uh, our market is increasingly now dominated by players who, in every market, the, the top big, you know, the head market controls and dominate, but arguably in China and in Hong Kong, that will be even more intensely so simply because the digitalization of China is such that the big players are now so powerful. But on the other hand, they are at the mercy and sometimes they are the victims, sometimes they are the perpetrator of issues and having huge conflict with either the Chinese sovereign or the US sovereign or both. And uh, so we have to really navigate. Then capital is flowing among all three and trying to manage in that is really fundamentally the challenge the Hong Kong market faces. So far we're doing well, but you know, it is a big, big giant boss that we just have to gingerly moving around between them because otherwise we could get easy to get crushed. Thanks very much for that, Charles. So uh, I'm, I'm delighted to hear that the theme of, of data and technology has come up in everyone's comments. Um, and I would be, right? I run a reg tech company, so those topics are near and dear to my heart. But I know that we have a number of people who are participating in the discussion tonight uh, who come from the reg tech world. We have involvement from the Reg Tech Association of Singapore, of Hong Kong, uh, of Australia. Um, and so I, I think that for many of our listeners, uh, that topic is one that um, I'd like to draw everyone else out on. Uh, we'll move now into Q&A. Uh, with the audience, again, with a view to sort of keeping this a conversational um, conver discussion. Um, the, the nice thing about being moderator is I get to ask the first question. Um, so so I'll, I'll ask, uh, Gary, maybe if you can offer a view. Um, there seems to me to be some friendly rivalry, if you will, uh, as Charles has just mentioned, among the different major Asian markets. Tokyo, Singapore, Shanghai, um, of course, Hong Kong, and to some extent, even, even Sydney. And, and we see all of them spending attention looking at technology, looking at the opportunities that technology creates, which most Matsuo-san spoke to, um, looking at how technology innovation creates job opportunities in economies with graying populations, um, and so for us in the reg tech world, we're watching that and we're asking ourselves, if we're setting up an Asia presence, which is the right market given the various political cross currents that Charles just discussed? 
Um, so without saying which is your favorite child, Gary, I wonder, I wonder if you can just uh, maybe lay out for us just what are the, some of the things that one needs to think about as they think this through? Well, let me start by saying I love all my children. So, <laughs> you know, I, I love all my daughters. So like, I love Miko. Um, <laughs> but, but Stephen, you know, look, there, there's, a, there's a reality of the world here. Um, and you talked about the Asia markets competing with the Asia markets. It's not an Asia versus Asia. It's a markets in the world competing with markets in the world. We live in a world today where money moves at the speed of light. Um, transactional volumes are measured in milliseconds. And the ability for people to transact anywhere around the world and translate into currency and translate into execution is measured in micro milliseconds. So the domestic home field competitive advantage that people once had um, because people want to be listed in their domestic market and there were competitive reasons, it still may exist for a domestic company that's appealing to a retail market. But on an institutional playing field, every market is competing with every markets. Um, like, you know, the, the, part of the, the, the Japanese new mantra is to be more competitive. You know, whether it's on, on access to markets, we, we heard about translating things to English, tax rates, tax reform, access. These, all of these issues play into uh, market participants' decisions, where to transact, how to transact, where to list, where to execute. You know, historically, I will, be, I will be highly complimentary of the Asian markets, whether it be Hong Kong and Singapore. The two of them have been in a fairly... I think friendly competition um, to be forward leaning and try and, and bring new concepts into the market, new products into the market, new ways to execute in the market, new regulation in the market. So when Loretta was talking about dashboards, that's like dashboards to me is really interesting. I do believe, and I know Stephen, you do as well, that the new regulatory concept of the 20 of the of the 20s could be forward looking or real time dashboards yeah we're all good at doing var and we're all good at doing risk metrics and we're all good at doing you know balance sheet usage and leverage ratio and all those financial ratios but can we get to a dashboard type environment where we're talking about culture and conduct like, hey, we're, we're, we're high on the dashboard and culture and conduct. And we've had regulators around the world for the last decade plus trying to do horizontal reviews of culture and conduct. And if we're now getting to a point where in places like uh, Singapore or places like Hong Kong, that, that this is being embraced as a real-time metric, I think this is clearly where the world's going and the markets are small enough, but important enough to the world where you can lead on this cutting edge. Thanks, Gary. That's great. Let me let me uh, offer it up to some of the other panelists. Would anyone like to react to some of Gary's comments just there before we? Yeah, move on? can I react to Gary, please? Yeah, please go ahead, Loretta. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, Gary, you you speak of a dream, right? Of uh, real time dashboards and how real time dashboards can, um, you know, make better decisions for us, provide good information. But um, maybe it's a boots on the ground kind of view, right? Um, <laughs> something like that um, requires, I mean, we see two big challenges, data quality and of course data security, right? So the focus on making sure that we can collect quality data, the accumulated data that we have and how we can you know, kind of clean up our dirty data that we have at the moment so that we can build this dashboard, that's quite a big challenge. And then making sure that uh, we use all our um, techniques available to us to ensure the protection of that data from end to end. That's quite a big challenge as well. So yeah, I, you speak of the dream that I wish that we can easily attain, but uh, improving the quality of reporting, improving the dashboards, uh, uh, information quality, something that I, mean, I, I hope to put in place uh, soon, right? because we know that this um, um, such dashboards will give us better information flows, better decisioning rights, better communications. But I think it's, it's quite a challenge. Well, Loretta, look, and Charles will know this too. If you think back not that many years ago to where financial service industry was on financial metrics 
And I would have said in, I don't know, to pick a year in, in, in 1980, that we would have real time VAR metrics and we would have real time balance sheet usage and real time leverage and real time margining and real time cross product margining and all the things that you guys just do that every bank does today and doesn't think about. Mm -hmm. 40 years ago, that would have seemed like, no, that can't happen. And today it seems like, well, you can't run a financial institution if you don't do that. So the world evolves in the level of computing today, quantum computing, the level of cloud capacity, the security of the cloud, the, 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 the continued evolution of AI, I think is gonna move this a lot faster. Look, my personal view is gonna move this a lot faster than people think. But I agree with you, there, there are some natural barriers. <laughs> Yeah, if, if, if I could also chip in, um, I think uh, this is a fascinating uh, development. I'm speaking now in my private capacity because I already left the exchange. One of the things that I wanted to do is to actually look at the market by looking deeper. And uh, China today is completely digitalized. So the question we're asking ourselves is that why do we have to finance on the company level? Why do we have to finance directly from the financial institutions? Why cannot we do something on three levels to get the water all the way down to the tree like the Israeli dripping irrigation? That is essentially looking at cash flow blocks rather than a company's debt or equity because that requires you to look at the company and, on, and then once the company is small enough, it doesn't pay for financial institutions to really spend the time to look at it. So therefore little guys and creative individuals and all the people in China who today are already completely operating on a digital platform, never gonna receive any financing from the big institutions simply because it just doesn't pay. But if we actually are able to crystallize the underlying where financing is based on, on cash flow blocks and where cash flow blocks, then little guys, they don't have any collateral, they have nothing, but they have cash flow, future cash flow that can be offered to, you know, uh, for revenue sharing. And then we look at the next level, who is going to be in the person who is the closest to all the little guys who are able to capture mm -hmm. and evaluate and price and to collect returns automatically on those little cash flows from the little guys. And then it's basically an anal analog to a circular, a, a cellular, so China today, all the economy, every little guy is working in a little eco circular, that little cell. The cell has a host, whether that's a platform company, whether or that's the big purchaser or they're the aggregator of, you know, logistics, whatever it is, whoever controls the cash flow, then we should make sure that they become the frontier financial institution that actually do the lending, do the investing, but collecting returns directly electronically, digitally. And then you put money on top of it and they become, they just listed their units as a, and, you know, a, a, as a manager. So if you are able to divide that, then we are essentially governing financing at the very little blocks of revenue. And you can absolutely disclose every single minute detail of that block. That will make financial transactions so much more transparent. And in China today, my dream is that in five years, we will be treating hundreds of thousands of cash flows rather than maybe thousands or hundreds of th hundreds of companies. Mm. Then you well, will have risk management, corporate governance and technology in a very different uh, frame. And I think that picks up very nicely on the point that Gary was making about the fact that we have not just a, a ubiquitous amount of data Loretta, notwithstanding the fact that that data needs to be cleaned, but we're getting better and better at that as well. Um, but you know, there's a saying in, uh, I guess, in physics that more is different. When you have so much data, uh, there's a qualitative change in what that makes possible. I think people are interested in seeing those changes, and so they're calling for the for the technology innovation that allows for these dreams that you're all articulating um, to be to be made manifest. Um, let me move to the audience and, and invite people to um, submit questions. 
and I will I will scan through them and and offer some to uh, to our panelists. Um, and and if I may, I'll I'll draw on one, uh, and I won't direct this to any of the the individual speakers. But one of our listeners makes the point that there is a trade-off between business innovation and regulation, right? Heavy-handed regulation squelches innovation and uh, untrammeled innovation may result in harm to society that regulators are responsible for managing. And the question is, how can those two forces be balanced in a way that allows you to sort of make the best of, of all worlds. Um, and if I may, uh, I, I, Matsuo-san, I'd, I'd, I'd ask you to address that as, as, as the one regulator on the panel. Um, and, um, and Charles, if I can come back to you again with reference to a lot of the work that the HKAX has done in recent years to, to focus on deterring misconduct and to make risk management a competitive advantage rather than a cost. How, are, how is that balance best struck? Uh, Matsuo-san? Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Stephen. And the, uh, it, uh, my impression is that the, uh, the world regulator is going now moving to kind of agile thinking of uh, agile uh, way of thinking, which is like experiment, which is like sandbox kind of uh, type of regulation, which you can try the like small amount. And the, if there is a, a like shortage, you can fix it later. So uh, you have to be uh, flexible if you want to deal with the new technology. And the uh, you have to. And the other point is uh, whether it is the center of the financial uh, system, sustain, uh, the safety or not. I mean, it's if you're per uh, it's not the center of the issue. I mean, you can try and uh, try and error and fix it. So uh, it's more and more like uh, like agile way of regulation. That's what uh, the like y UK, what um, I don't know, United States, but in some way, United States, and in a way, China the same. Maybe let the IT company grow, and later they're gonna fix it. So I mean, so I mean, like there are many ways of agile way of the regulation, but the, the basic idea is whether it's a center of the financial system, but if it, uh, you can, you can, uh, mean, but if it's not, you can fix it later. So you can try and error. So, so innovation first, and then if we get things wrong, we can course correct later. And, and, and try small, small, very small, like experiments. So you mean, so there are many, many, dimensions. I... And, and Charles, how, how would you react to that? Innovate first and course correct later, or do we need to focus on trying to establish rules of the road before we let people out on it? Yeah, I actually do not think that's the, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not a real, uh, it's almost like a, a fake uh, a trade off. Uh, you don't really need to uh, somehow do this or the other. Um, and also for central marketplace, um, actually innovation is always lagging behind, unfortunately, because uh, uh, I, you know, I, I describe the market operator role usually as a pack of wolves, you know, uh, trying to cross the mountain, uh, snow mountain. The faster wolves are always on the front and the weak and older in the middle. And uh, the, the real guard is the exchange because the real guard does not we have universal obligation or universal service obligation. We can't really leave a lot of people behind saying, well, if you're too slow, we're gonna leave you. You can't because we have to get the whole pack moving. Obviously some pack, some people sometimes have to be left behind, but generally speaking, we are moving at the pace of the last mover rather than the front mover because you have to move everybody along. So how to make sure that you, why are you serving that universal service obligation, but really leading the market going into the right direction faster. And, and that's, a, that's a fundamental challenge for a market operator because you can't really do things just free on your own because you, know, you, know, you need to bring everybody along. So I would argue that the, the, the exchanges and operators are, tend to be more using that as the excuse for not being innovative enough, for not taking the leadership and you know, taking greater risk. And I think we need to foster a culture where, you know, there is reward for, for, for taking that innovation and the creativity forward 
because the DNA of the market operators, you never have to worry about it. We're going to move too fast. I think uh, the risk is always going to be we're moving too slow. Thanks, Charles. Um, here's another question from, from one of our participants, um, which I think is very well directed to Loretta and, and Gary, given some of what uh, the two of you have shared. Um, so the, the questioner points out that we've seen a whole bunch of fines for misconduct and risk management failures of, of various sorts, um, non-financial risk management failures in, in financial institutions all around the world. And those institutions are being held accountable and being forced to disgorge significant fines. And, and the, the question that's being asked is, do we expect to see that persist? Do we expect to see that becoming a big deal in Asia? And tied in with that is the point, Loretta, that you made that we see regulators moving more and more so to individual accountability regimes. Right. So if you find a financial institution, you punish its shareholders, but the perpetrators of some wrongdoing don't necessarily uh, are they're not necessarily held accountable. And regulators are trying to strike a new balance in that regard. So, Loretta, if I can ask you maybe to, to comment on that, whether from the Singapore perspective or from the industry perspective, um, and then, Gary, if, if you if you'd follow on with your own views. I I, sorry. <clears throat> yep. Okay. Sorry. I lost you there for a moment. Yeah. Um, it's an inter inter interesting point. And you're absolutely right. Right. Um, instead of punishing the institution alone, which then the shareholders suffer and actually the shareholders were innocent in the whole event, you should be, you should be punishing the individuals, which is that's something that the MES has now been focusing on. So I talked about the IAC guidelines earlier. So one of the things that we are doing and putting in place right now is identifying all our senior managers telling them that you, um, I'm going through, of course, making sure that they are fit and proper for the roles, but more importantly, more importantly, telling them that they need to take accountability and be responsible not only for their actions, but for the actions of the people under them. So we are, I, I think but we can see that the, the, the slant of that from the regulator standpoint is to try to um, change behaviors so that people know that it is, it's, you are now personally accountable. So I talked about um, the OCBC culture and conduct initiatives that we rolled out last year. So we rolled out a whole slew of them. And in order to kind of comply with this, comply with these regulations and kind of balance the, the business bit of it, is we enhanced and reviewed quite a lot of our performance management frameworks. We reviewed our remuneration frameworks as well to make sure that these sort of um, monitoring and assessment of culture and conduct standards, it's, we, can, we, can, we can reinforce the good conduct bits of that. Excellent. Yep. Stephen, look, I, I don't have a particular point of view on the Asian regulators, how they're looking at this, if they're looking at it differently than the you know, European and US regulators. We sort of know what the European and the US regulators have done. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, the regulators are in a difficult position. You know, when a regulator goes into an organization and they find wrongdoing, they know they see wrongdoing, which is, is they, it may, that, that's probably the easy part of what they do to some extent. To figure out how, what, when, and where and point fingers is sometimes very difficult. And when you come out, when you came out of the global financial crisis with a lot of the new regulation that was put on firms, a lot of the major decision-making in these firms was, I won't say it was decentralized, but it was, it was almost centralized into bigger, broader, vaster committees so regulators could try and understand culture and conduct more. So every time a, a financial institution would make a big underwriting or make a big capital commitment or decide to take out a piece of business or decide not to do a piece of business, it was done in a large global committee type structure. And, and by the way, I, I, don't, I approve of that. I'm, I'm not saying that's wrong. But then it's very difficult when you're when you're going back to my first comment, you're looking at something two or three or four or five years later and saying, OK, we want to create accountability. Well, accountability just might be the firm because the firm had a process where literally hundreds, if not thousands of people were involved in the various committees and the various infrastructure to make the decision. Yeah, so I think it sounds a little bit like um, what Charles was saying okay. earlier that it's, it's an artificial distinction. It's not necessarily an either or, it's, it's, it's both and. 
And we have to leave it to the wisdom of the regulators to figure out where they should focus energy on a case by case basis. Um, Charles, uh, there's another question from the audience that um, pointed to you. Uh, of course, any of the panelists should feel free to comment on it. Um, but it's one that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, Loretta, I know that you have a real passion and interest in the reg tech space. So the reg tech association of Hong Kong, um, has done some research and they argue that the scale of the reg tech industry in Hong Kong has expanded by 10 times within five years. I'm, I'm not sure what, what the metrics were by which that, that analysis was done. Um, but half of the, the expansion uh, is accounted for by startup companies that have been around for less than two years. Um, and they're not just targeting the financial sectors, but as Gary pointed out, there's this innovation is affecting all industries, government, IT, architecture. Um, so Charles, for, for the Hong Kong market specifically, um, we've seen that the Hong Kong Monetary Authority has been trying to promote reg tech adoption in Hong Kong. Um, again, moving it away from a niche offering to something that's increasingly mainstream. What's your view of what happens next in that space in your market? Yeah, I think uh, the reason you seem to be seeing a lot of activities in that space uh, and you ask whether or not ultimately they succeed and also, also ultimately who are they going to be servicing? Are they servicing people in Hong Kong or they're servicing people into China or they're servicing international clients? I think uh, you need to uh, have uh, understanding that the reason Hong Kong is seeing this sort of a heightened level of activity is very reflective of three things. One, um, Hong Kong vis-a-vis -vis China, and, and maybe, maybe in the order is one, uh, China's financial services, generally speaking, has been quite inadequate in terms of servicing the real economy, uh, in terms of really playing the kind of roles in China's economy, the way that US or Western financial institutions have played in their economies. So there in the Western uh, you know, countries and economies, financial institutions are very deep rooted. They're very well established. They are penetrating into almost to most of the corners of the economy, be able to service big and small and, and shallow and deep. Vis-a-vis -vis China, it's a reasonably shallow service layer and it doesn't really cover a lot of areas and Chinese economy is emerging, it's so big. So as a result, you know, there are a lot of areas where people actually can innovate and be able to do something and quickly make money and creating value in pockets of the economy where the financial services really do not. So RecTech is, is the name RecTech is really FinTech and to basically do anything that ultimately either allow you to arbitrage regulatorily or allow you to be compliant or allow you to do something that currently there's no regulation. So there's a lot of this, you know, economic motivation and opportunities for people to start something nimble and to be able to try and potentially make money quickly. Whereas such, econ such opportunities probably are not as readily available in the Western economy. That's number one. And number two, there's just a lot of uh, people, a lot of creative you know, talent at the grassroots level that are just uh, all over China, particularly in, you know, in Shenzhen and near the Greater Bay Area, close to Hong Kong. So they tend to really uh, you know, concentrate it in this area. And then the reason they do it in Hong Kong is again, a much more laissez-faire, kind of a free open economy that unless there is a prohibition of it, everything is permitted. And that sort of a regulatory environment allow a lot of those entrepreneurs to come to Hong Kong to do it because if they do something similar in China, you need to get the, you know, the approval first. So I think the combination of the inadequate of the incumbent financial services sector, the massive uh, technology opportunities and talent, and the free and open regulatory environment in Hong Kong, not financial regulation, but just basically overall, you know, uh, innovation regulation is such that uh, you see a lot of this activity. I would argue most of those ultimate opportunities to benefit or service is gonna be inside China rather than they're gonna export that into the Western economy. Excellent. Charles, thank you for that. Um, we have more questions than we're going to have time. So uh, let me just invite our listeners, um, get, get your questions in now, and I, I'll, I'll do my best to try to get them all answered. But 
Uh, one that's been waiting for a little while that I'd like to put to the group, um, and we could have, I think, a, a whole session on this question alone, is uh, on the topic of sovereign digital currencies, which is um, a topic that has had quite a lot of attention uh, in particularly the past uh, couple of years. And, and the question is, to what extent uh, are sovereign digital currencies by different countries uh, a help or a hindrance to the trading of cash flow blocks, um, to the kinds of developments, Charles, that, that, that you had just forecast. Um, how, how will this tech innovation around digital currencies uh, have broader macroeconomic and market uh, impact? Um, I suppose we could put that to, to, to anyone here. Um, Charles, we, we, we'd love to hear you on that, but Gary, I know you know quite a lot about this as well. Let's, let's start with Charles. He seems eager to answer. No, no, no. I thought it was a question directed at me. No, no, no. I actually, I am not eager to answer that question. Gary, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, look, I, I, as, as, as I've been talking, you know, for, for, for the session, you know, the world is global. The world is digitized. We're, we're, we're not going back from there. So as we're, as we're seeing, having a digital currency is just a natural evolution of the digital real-time millisecond, microsecond world we live in. So we've been speeding up executions for the last, I don't know, for as long as I've been involved in financial services. It's all been, you know, speeding execution and making execution more efficient. Um, the currency market was actually, in some some funny way, the first market to go digital. If you go back to the first electronic broking system, it was really in the currency markets when we had a lot more currencies before before the euro. Um, and so now we're taking that even further and further into a digitized market. So look, I, I just think that you have to face the reality that with more computing power, more computing engines and more um, computer executions, there's gonna be more and more need for digital currency. Charles, you wanna read? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree. I think the, the digital currency is really uh, is not the leader of uh, what happened uh, in, you know, on the ground. It's actually just a reflected reflection of what is already um, pretty much the case uh, in, in, you know, in the ground. But in terms of how that would do, you know, help or hinder um, the kind of uh, futuristic trading model that I was talking about, I think it definitely will help. And uh, but you know it's already that way anyway. Um, the whole idea I saw one of the questions from the audience is that if you have all these little cash flows uh, blocks for people to trade, uh, you know how is going to be disclosed? At least today you have a few directors who are able to be accountable for the whole idea of being able to trade cash flow blocks is to do away with all the current way of disclosure and reporting, which is always happens. You know, when a company finishes the whole year, the auditors goes in and then do the work. So if something is wrong and then you find out a few weeks, a few months later, the whole idea about cash flow blocks is that that cash flow blocks, all the key components of that, each cash flow blocks need to be monitored and be able to disclose real time. And then the issue is who is going to be able to monitor it who is going to be able to execute it? Who is going to be able to price it? And who is able to? Who is going to be able to extract the return from it? That's what I talked about. The eco host, eco circle host. So essentially, financial services provision need to be lowered from those levels that is completely distant and away, detached from the real economy, to the people who actually run on the ground. So in China, I would predict that uh, we will still have Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan kind of financial institutions, but by and large in five years, China will have maybe, a, maybe 500, you know, little Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, but they're not really financial institutions. They are real economic activity organizers and operators. And then part of their business is to use their infrastructure and use their influence over 
the little cash flows, the little businesses to actually be the financial services provider? Charles, a couple of things come, come through from that answer for me that tie in neatly with some of the questions that, that have been posed by the audience. Um, as a guy in technology who works with data, right, there's the, the saying that data is the new oil. So what you're describing is a world in which the level of data will grow exponentially, as is already true, but, but perhaps even at a, a more highly accelerated pace. And with that data come new opportunities to do new things. That's one point. A second point that comes through in what you're sharing, Charles and, and, and Gary, I think uh, you made this point as well. Um, we really can't look at the world as you've got a marketplace and then you've got babysitters, right? There's, there's the players in the market and then there's the regulators that are, that are sort of watching them. In fact, the regulators are themselves a market participant. And for a lot of the innovation that's going to be coming forward in, in the next years, it's going to put new demands on the regulatory community to innovate more rapidly, to change up some of the skill sets that are housed within those regulator, uh, regulatory bodies so that they can be uh, more effective market participants. With that, however, come some of the concerns, Loretta, that you raised, and this ties into one of the questions. Um, privacy rights is a real concern. Uh, information security is a real concern. And if we're going to actualize any of the opportunities that the digital domain affords us, we've got to do it safely. We've got to do it in a way that is respectful of the interests of customers and of society. And so there's perhaps a bit of a tension there. And maybe that's one area where the regulators can play a unique role because they can step into those, those issues. And as Matsuo-san referenced, we can innovate first and course correct later. So with that, um, Matsuo-san, let me maybe draw you out and then Loretta ask, ask you to pick up on, on that as well. What's, what's the, where is the balance to be had in viewing the regulator as a collaborator in innovation uh, versus the regulator as a security guard? Okay. Uh the, there are a couple of points, and the first is uh, the, uh, especially like the countries in Japan or maybe United States, uh, the, uh, the the privacy is very very important. So if you uh, you have to think the uh, privacy as a very and uh, privacy mean the uh, right of the like uh, controlling uh, personal like uh, information. That's a uh, very very tough, and uh, you have to. You have to put it in a very high kind of priority. That's first. And the, the second is the more and the more, it's not like a financial regulation, but it's the more and more, more, it seems to me like uh, the uh, like uh, antitrust kind of stuff, which is uh, that's uh, the monopoly kind of stuff. So if you, I mean, so it's it's a, it's a financial, but the, it, but the, the basic, uh, basic, very most uh, important thing is uh, like a uh, monopoly or like antitrust kind of uh, approaches. Like uh, it seems it's emerging in everywhere. So I mean, uh, you have to make use of the data uh, fully. That's the uh, the financial regulators' attitude in everywhere, uh, and including Japan and maybe Hong Kong and the, uh, Singapore. But the uh, privacy is a uh, you have to think of privacy uh, at the very top. And the, the other thing is, uh, it's not really a financial regulator's issue, but the uh, antitrust and the uh, monopoly kind of stuff is uh, uh, growing more and more uh, issues for the regulator or the country itself. That, that's my impression. So you have to take the right balance in this uh, uh, issue. Excellent. Um, I'm afraid we're at time, but but I, I want to give Loretta the opportunity to 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 respond to that question. So um, to the Asia Society okay. organizers, if we can maybe extend the public session by just a few minutes, so that Loretta has a chance to offer her own her own views, uh, and then we will switch over to the private session um, for those who have elected to stay for that. 
Loretta, do you want to yeah, comment sure. on that? Yeah, know. yeah. I'll just make a short comment about that. About that, you, you speak of the tension, right, between business and uh, data privacy issues. Um, I would like to actually give a, quite a bit of kudos to MAS because their style of supervision has quite evolved over the years. I think you guys know that. They can be quite rough, don't get me wrong. When we are, when we are naughty, they can be quite rough on us. But um, their style of engaging us has, one, has changed to one of collaboration. And we really, really, really like that right now. So, you know, every time there's a new regulation, they will do a, a, a massive consultation with us. They want to understand what the impact is to business, to operations, and they kind of then tweak and make sure that the regulation doesn't come out as blunt. So that brings me to my second point. And this is my own personal comment, so not, uh, not um, attributed to OCBC, but I do feel that privacy laws are quite blunt at the moment. They were just issued and, and you know, they say that, you know, if you don't have customer's consent, you can't do this. You must have customer consent to do that, that kind of thing. So it is quite blunt at the moment. And I do feel that, um, however, I do feel that the regulators in Singapore, because of this more collaborative approach, we can engage them in discussions, engage them in uh, talks to try to lobby and, and tell them, you know, the to try and tell them the, the, the rigors of, of doing business with these privacy barriers. And they do take into consideration, they do, and they do listen. So I guess we're moving in that direction right now, where the supervision approach is more of a collaborative one. And I think that's quite welcome. Excellent. Um, let me offer thanks to all of our panelists for what I found to be a fascinating conversation. I hope our audience agreed. Um, Gary, thanks for staying up late with me for this. And um, I think that's the end of the public session. And we'll, in just a moment, move over to the private session. Thank you to all the speakers on behalf of Starling and on behalf of the Asia Society Hong Kong Center. Um, I'm, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. And we will, be, for those of you staying online for the private member session, uh, please stay online and we will put you, uh, we will transfer you. Thank mm -hmm. you.